So I'm going to be giving our first reading today. We've got two readings. The first one is from Psalm 143, and it's taken from an unusual version. It's called the Passion Version, but that should, I think, should appear... Um, I don't know if it is going to appear on your screens, is it? No. Okay, sorry, I'll just be reading, I'll just be reading from Psalm 143, and it's the Passion Version. And it reads like this. Lord, you must hear my prayer, for you are faithful to your promises. Answer my cry, O righteous God. Don't bring me into your courtroom for judgment. For there is no one who is righteous before you. My enemies have chased and caught me and crushed my life into dust. Now I'm living in the darkness of death's shadow. My inner being is in depression and my heart is heavy, dazed with despair. I remember the glorious miracles of days gone by. And I often think of all the wonders of old. Now I'm reaching out to you, thirsting for you, like the dry, cracked ground that thirsts for rain. Lord, come quickly and answer me, for my depression deepens and I'm about to give up. Don't leave me now or I'll die. Let the dawning day bring me revelation of your tender, unfailing love. Give me light for my path and teach me, for I trust in you. Save me from all of my enemies, for I hide myself in you. I just want to obey all you ask of me. So teach me, Lord, For you are my great, for you, sorry, are my God. Your gracious spirit is all I need. So lead me on good paths that are pleasing to you, my one and only God. Lord, if you rescue me, it will bring you more glory, for you are true to your promises. Bring me out of these troubles. Since I am your loving servant, destroy all those who are trying to harm me. And because you are so loving and kind to me, silence all of my enemies. So that's the first part of our reading. And the second reading is um, taken from John. Uh, it's the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. And for those of you who don't know, uh, what that's about. John is again a biography of Jesus's life and the the reading I've just read is from Psalm, is from the book of Psalms which is like a group of prayers again written from the Bible. So I'm just trying to here we go. So John chapter 10 verse 10. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect. Life in, in its fullness until you overflow. So this is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. I'm going to invite Leslie now who's going to come and speak to us uh, and start off our topic over the, over the coming weeks, which is all about uh, mental health and well-being. Good morning. So, um, as Daniel said, we're going to be beginning a new series this morning in which we want to talk about mental health and well-being. 
historically it's not been something that we talk about in our society or in our churches. And while I think that this picture is changing and possibly even more so since COVID because people are realising how important this is to talk about, you know, there still seems to be some stigma and shame attached to it, which we really want to challenge. John 10.10, which Daniel just read, is an important starting point. When Jesus said that he came, that we might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus cares that we live well. The enemy comes to steal and destroy. You know, many today live with crippling mental health struggles that steal life. So let's talk about it rather than ignore it because it's just a bit too challenging maybe. Let's care about these issues in ourselves and to seek God's fullness of life. And let's try to support others as they struggle. Let's invite God into our conversations. There are a lot of different recognized mental health conditions as well as some more generalized ones. And we're not going to pretend at all to be experts on any of them. Some of us will be vulnerable and speak from personal experience. So please be gentle and gracious with us. Above all, let's, as we navigate some of these challenging topics, both on Sundays and in our life groups, avoid being in any way judgmental of others. Did you know that at any one time, one in four people are struggling with mental health illness? Now, this is a pre-COVID statistic, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if it's gone up. But what about the other three in four? Because if we assume that they're all fine, we're probably wrong. The one, the one in four, are those who've actually either been diagnosed or are having symptoms and are seeking help. Because to get into that statistic, you actually have to tell someone. So those other remaining three in every four, you know, several of them may also be struggling in some way or another. Because there's still such stigma attached to mental illness, negative attitude and even discrimination. This leads to people being ashamed to discuss their situations. Often you'll find Christians ashamed and feeling guilty for struggling with these illnesses, feeling that, you know, if they could just trust God more, it would go away. I will come back to this, but for now, I just want to say that that's a lie. Just as we Christians suffer from physical illnesses, we also struggle with mental illness. And it bears no reference to our levels of faith. That's why as a church, we've been so pleased to partner with Kintsugi Hope, a charity who have been working to bring conversations on this topic into more general acceptance. Sometimes, sadly, as Christians, we can fall into this trap of feeling like we have to present as doing okay because God is with us. I think that's a real shame because it prevents us from being real real with God and real with each other. Patrick Regan, who's the founder of Kintsugi Hope, his book title challenges that perception where it speaks of honesty over silence. And he reminds us that it's okay not to be okay. This morning, we're going to look a little more specifically at anxiety and depression, which may be experienced alongside each other, but not always. Let's try and understand each one separately first, briefly. So anxiety is something we all feel from time to time, a natural response to help us avoid dangerous situations and solve everyday problems. It has a physical and chemical reaction in the body to help it do those things. It's kind of your basic fight or flight response mechanism to fear. And it becomes a problem when it's more severe and long lasting and actually also when those things that cause our anxiety are not the emergency situations we face, but the more ordinary everyday situations of life. There are physical, psychological and behavioral effects of anxiety. Some examples of which are heart palpitations, hyperventilation, hyperventilation sorry, um, dizziness, mind racing or mind going blank, difficulty making decisions, repetitive thoughts, vivid dreams, desire to escape social situations, distress, repetitive trekking, and I know I said that was a few examples, that really is just only a few examples. 
Anxiety is more than just worry. Worry motivates us to do something about what we're concerned about. Anxiety hangs around and can often make us incapable of addressing our situation, but often takes us round and round in circles. Kirsty Corley described anxiety as caring too much. In everyday terms, it's your brain not being able to turn off, unanswered messages, reading negative into every scenario, apologising for things you don't actually need to, self-doubt. It's constantly asking what if. Depression is also common, but the word can be used in different ways. Depression is not feeling sad or blue from time to time when something bad happens. That's just a natural reaction and that lifts easily when the situation changes. A clinical depression is one that lasts for at least two weeks and affects a person's behaviour with physical, emotional and cognitive effect. It can interfere with someone's ability to work and it can interfere with relationships. Though it's important to realise that some people who live long term with depression are highly capable and successful people and you wouldn't always notice what they're living with. It's a real hidden condition. Did you know that J.K. Rowling, Emma Thompson, Winston Churchill and Isaac Newton all live or lived with depression? And that's just a handful of examples. Tim Cantifer, a psychiatrist, suggests that depression and anxiety are not a sign of weakness, but signs of trying to remain strong for too long. Some examples of symptoms can be an unusually sad mood that doesn't go away, loss of enjoyment and interest in things that you would normally enjoy, lack of energy and tiredness, difficulty concentrating or making decisions, sleeping or eating either too much or too little. And of course, in extreme, can lead to thoughts of self-harm or suicide. And of course, people can experience these and other symptoms in varying degrees. Both anxiety and depression can come about for a range of reasons. Some of these can be due to chemical changes in the body and are associated with other health conditions. Either can be brought on by a current or a past traumatic event, or a social situation such as disadvantage and deprivation. They can result from a lack of positive relationships, a long-term physical illness, or times of hormonal change, such as puberty, pregnancy, and menopause. And I should say it's important to note that dads can get postnatal depression too. Someone might experience both anxiety and depression together, but not necessarily at all. Now, the good news is that a large number of people who experience either of these can find support and healing through medication and or talking therapies, but some still do struggle long term. In addition to walking alongside a number of people who struggle with either or both of these, I encountered both for the first time personally last year. After six months of dealing with a highly stressful situation, I began to recognise that I was experiencing probably quite mild depression and some anxiety. For me, the depression began to ease as the situation finally changed, but I actually found that the anxiety got worse. I was surprised by how physical I found some of the symptoms of anxiety. Sometimes I was completely frozen and unable to process my thoughts or make decisions. And at other times I was teary and panicky. To be honest, it was quite shocking and frightening to experience these for the first time. So obviously so far this has been quite factual. But where do we find God in all of this and how do we support each other in these situations? Firstly, I want to say that God cares. He's interested in us, in all that we go through, not just the good stuff. The psalm that we heard this morning, 143, is just one example of many where someone is pouring out their heart to God about how low they feel in a situation and about all their anxieties. And one of the things I love about this psalm is how David, who wrote it, how real he is with God. He doesn't kind of just nice up the situation at all. He cries to God to hear him and he describes how crushed, how he feels crushed into the dust 
living in the darkness of death's shadows, with his inner being in depression, heart heavy, dazed with despair. Let's be real with God, and if we can, let's be real with others we trust. And in this kind of conversation, it probably is really important that we trust the person we're talking to. But then I think that David does something interesting. He says, I remember the glorious miracles of past days, and I often think of all the wonders of old. Now I'm reaching to you, thirsting like the dry, cracked ground, thirsty for rain. I think that act of remembering what God has done in the past, whether it's our own past or what we might hear from others or things we read in the Bible, it helps us to remember that it doesn't always have to be like this. It can change our perspective to remember this doesn't have to be a permanent state. I spoke to somebody this week and, um, about this topic and they likened that for them in their experience to hearing different stories in our head. And it's like anxiety or depression tell one story. But we need to remember that the stories anxiety and depression tell us are not the only story or the only truth. And we can also listen to God's story or God's perspective. And that's where remembering can really be helpful. And then we try to listen to God's story and perspective louder than the stories of anxiety and depression. Now, I realize as I say that, that might sound really easy, but in reality, it is not easy at all. It's really difficult. It's a real battle. But for some, it can really help. At my worst last year, I wrote the following on a post-it note. I kind of love post-it notes. I've got them all over the place. And it reads, remember, there is a light. Even if it is at the end of a dark tunnel, it is there. You will come out of this and you will come out stronger and deeper. I felt that that was something God was showing me. And for me and for others I've spoken to, holding on to that promise of light and God's hope is, re is a really important perspective. I'm not 100% sure whether I'm through the tunnel yet, only time is going to tell that. But I do feel sure that now I can see God's light. The psalmist continues crying out to God and asking him to reveal his love and hope. And there's such a combination of raw honesty, desperation, and yet continual hoping. I think it's also important to remember that experiencing these situations of anxiety and depression are not due to being weak or being a failure, nor is it to do with lack of faith. David, when he wrote this psalm, was in the situation of being chased by his son Absalom, who was seeking to take his life and challenge his throne. David was simply trying to live for God in the anointing of king that God had called him to. If you read many of the prophets, you'll also find that as they go about proclaiming God's word, they find themselves in the depths of despair. Elijah is a really good example. Um, if you've not read it, 1 Kings 19 is where you find the story I'm about to talk about. And we read that after he defeats the prophets of Baal, which he was doing in the course of his ministry and his life, his life is then threatened by Jezebel and he runs away. And what I love about this account is how practical God is with him. God sends an angel to him with food and water. And after he slept, he wakes, this angel wakes him up and, and gives him this food and water. And then he sleeps for a second time. And he's just left to rest. And the angel reappears with this provision again of food and water. And it's only after the practical situations of food, water and sleep that God speaks. And even then when God speaks, it's in gently in the quiet wind, if you remember the account, not in the noise and commotion of earthquakes and fires. I think we can learn from God in this of how to support others and ourselves in depression and anxiety. We can be practical. It's about learning self-care, self-compassion. Are we getting enough sleep? Are we eating healthily? Are we getting some exercise like going out for a walk? We can also take a practical look at things that might be causing stress or anxiety or the feelings of depression. Is there anything practical we can do to change some of these situations? 
I don't know, if we're working too much, can we do something positive to change that? Could we work to our actual hours? Could we talk to our boss about what's going on for that and see if they can support us in making some changes? Could we take or book some annual leave just to have a break rather than just keep going on regardless? Other things that can help, especially anxiety, is to pause and to try to pay attention to the things that we can see, smell, hear, touch, to breathe deeply and just be really aware of what's around us in that moment. And if we want to pray or meditate in that, it might be really helpful to just be really simple with that, like simply asking God to be with us as we breathe in each time. Listening to worship music or something calming like an instrumental piece can also help some people. And for others, it can help to refocus us by writing or thinking of a thankful list. A bit like David remembering the good of the past, we can bring to mind things that we are thankful for, both in the past and in the present. If that's really hard, you could even start by being thankful for negative things that you don't have to do. Like, I don't know, for me, that could be as extreme as something like, I'm really thankful I'm not standing at the edge of the, you know, church tower doing an um, abseil or a bungee jump or something. Um, I'd be very thankful not to do that. And, you know, so just to bring some, be creative, bring to mind some things you can definitely be thankful for to get you going in that thinking of thankfulness. And to be honest, a lot of this is good practice, even if we're not struggling, just simply to protect our own well-being. But the most helpful thing I think that we can do is to talk to someone. David cries out to God. We can talk to God, but we can also speak to a trusted friend about how we are and be real. And I think the most courageous thing, and often the hardest, is to speak to someone to ask them to help you find help. I mean professional help. When it's needed, it's so fantastic. There are a lot of resources and help out there. Initially, your GP would be a good place to go. And depending on the specifics of your situation, they might offer medication if it's to do with chemicals, um, or they might suggest some talking therapy. And there's a huge range of different kinds of talking therapies out there, and they'd try and help you to find the one that would be most beneficial for you. And there's lots of other charities that um, can help support as well. So I said I'd come back to this idea of faith. If we struggle with our mental health, we are not failures. It's not lack of faith, but living with it in faith is a way that God can work in and through us. And it can also be a way he demonstrates his love and power to others as well. You know, so if for you a courageous act was simply getting up this morning and tuning in, can I say, well done. You are loved, you are precious, and you are enough just as you are. Keep being real. Keep bringing your brokenness to God. If you're trying to support someone today, be gentle, be practical. Please listen to them. Please don't make assumptions. Ask how you can help, and then maybe listen again. And please, for all of us, can we keep praying for those who struggle? I'm going to end as I began. God wants for us fullness of life. That's what Jesus came to bring us. But you know, he did it through the cross, through the challenge. Fullness of life for many of us at some point may look like journeying through some difficult times. Joan reminded me recently of the hymn this week um, called, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. And one of my favorite verses is, O joy that seeks me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain, that morn shall tearless be. While these conditions of anxiety and depression are extraordinarily difficult, there is an invitation to journey in and through them with Jesus, to discover the joy in the pain, treasure in the journey, and the hope in the promise. 
So we're going to spend some time now just inviting the Spirit to speak to each of our individual situations. Lord, would you, would you come? Would you send your spirit to speak to us? Lord, if we're struggling, would we feel your presence? Would we recognize that we are enough, just as we are, because you love us? Just as uh, Leslie was uh, speaking to us, there was, there was certainly something which struck me, which was, which was that David had no, uh, yeah, he, he had no qualms about expressing his emotions. But I just want to pray for all those who have battled silently with anxiety and depression and felt that shame or fear. And uh, so, Lord, I want to just pray now that you would bless us to know that we're not alone that you are with us, there is light even at the end of a dark tunnel. And Father, would you help us to reach out for help? Would you help us not to uh, be silent, Lord, but know that we can reach out?